He may be the only person in history who fell in love with flight because President Calvin Coolidge took a vacation. A baby-faced Swede who flew a trainer in a loop around the center span of the Golden Gate Bridge. He was a stunningly talented pilot. It was said of him that he thought more quickly in three dimensions than most people did in two. His string of combat victories over New Guinea turned him into a national hero. He shot down an incredible 40 enemy aircraft before being removed from combat once and for all. A national treasure who could no longer be risked on the battlefield. When the endless cycle of parades and war bond rallies wore him down, he asked for and received assignment as a test pilot in the secret program that produced America's first combat jet. He is Richard Ira Bong, and he is a legend of air power. Richard Ira Bong was born September 24, 1920 in Superior, Wisconsin. Superior is a small town at the western tip of Lake Superior, and about as far north as you can be in Wisconsin without being in Minnesota. His father, Carl, had come to the United States from Sweden at the age of seven. He worked his way halfway across the continent before settling as a farmer in Poplar, Wisconsin, 20 miles to the southeast of Superior. Carl Bong married Dora Bryce and settled in to start a family. Richard was the first of their nine children, a quiet, thoughtful boy who grew up hunting and fishing in the dense forests around his family's farm. Known from an early age as Dick, he was first taken with aviation at the age of eight when President Calvin Coolidge decided to spend a summer vacation in Superior. And uh, every day the mail would be delivered uh, by a courier, uh, air courier, and uh, Richard saw the plane going over to every day, and I think it just fascinated him, and I think that was the start of his uh, love affair with aviation, and it just built from there. When the presidential party left town, so did the air couriers, but aviation had made its impression on young Dick. He contented himself with building model airplanes and dreaming of the day when he would learn how to fly. He played basketball, baseball, and hockey. He was a fisherman and hunter, played clarinet in the school band, and was active in the local 4-H club. He was, like almost everyone else in Poplar, a Lutheran, and he sang tenor in the choir every Sunday morning at Bethany Lutheran Church. Poplar was a town so small that its high school only lasted three years. To complete his senior year and make himself eligible for college and the civilian pilot training program, he commuted 44 miles round trip every day to Superior. In 1938, he graduated 18th in a class of more than 400. He attended Superior State Teachers College and enlisted in the civilian pilot training program. That government-sponsored flight training system was designed to boost the number of experienced pilots in the United States. The government justified the program based on the growing need for airmail and commercial pilots. In reality, the government's main concerns were the wars that were brewing in Europe and Asia. There was going to come a time, military planners believed, when the United States would need a lot of pilots quickly. Bong earned his pilot's license in a Piper J-3, and almost from the first showed a gift for aviation. He had a knack for it, and he learned that through the pilot training programs he had been in in college and, and afterwards, that uh, he was just a natural pilot, and that was the word that everybody used to describe him in all of his pilot training programs. He was just a natural pilot. He loved it, and it became evident uh, in the performance he turned in as a pilot. In 1941, Bong enlisted in the Army Air Aviation Cadet Program. In May, he shipped out to far-off and exotic California. He did his primary flight training in a Stearman biplane outside Tulare. He caught on quickly and moved on to flying Vulti BT-13s, the famous Vulti vibrator at Garner Field in Taft. He was, a, he was, as I said, a natural pilot. He had natural skills, natural abilities. And in those days, you didn't get a whole lot of instructions. Most of the pilots at Gardner simply flew, running up their hours and getting a feel for maneuvering in three dimensions. Bong quickly distinguished himself and was ordered to report for gunnery training. 
At Luke Field, near Phoenix, Arizona, he moved from the BT-13 to the AT-6, a single-engine fighter trainer that was smoother and more capable than the Baltese he'd been flying, but sluggish compared to real combat fighters. His gunnery trainer was Captain Barry Goldwater, the future senator and presidential candidate. Goldwater, a tough, precise teacher, said later that Bong was a talented pilot and those years hunting with his Winchester rifle in Wisconsin had honed his shooting skills. But Bong really proved himself one afternoon in an informal, impromptu hassle high over Luke Field. Bong, flying an AT-6, squared off against a Czech pilot in a P-38. The dogfight should have been a mismatch. The P-38, after all, was much faster and more agile than the AT-6, and the Czech pilot had hundreds of hours more flight time than Bong. But no matter how the P-38 pilot maneuvered, he couldn't keep Bong off his tail. The two would square off, and in a few seconds, Bong would be closing in on the P-38 from behind. The Czech pilot upon landing pronounced Bong the best natural pilot he had ever seen. Bong was at Luke when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in December 1941. Like the other pilots, he wanted into the war as soon as he could get there. A month later, he received his wings and his officer's commission. But rather than sending him into combat, the Army kept him at Luke as a gunnery instructor. Dick Bong's war seemed to end before it had started. For almost six months after the American entry into World War II, Second Lieutenant Dick Bong was stuck stateside. As a gunnery instructor at Luke Field in Arizona, he trained other young fighter pilots and then watched as they departed for points unknown overseas. In May 1942, however, the Army Air Force assigned Bong to Hamilton Field in San Francisco. There, pilots were learning how to fly the new Lockheed P-38 Lightning Fighter. The P-38s were big, fast, and had proven themselves unsuitable for combat in Europe. The cooling systems for the plane's twin engines froze up at low temperatures common at altitudes over Europe. The pilots training in P-38s at Hamilton all understood where they were headed, the Pacific. After arriving at Hamilton, Bong quickly came to the attention of Major General George C. Kenney, commanding general of the 4th Air Force. Bong was both a gifted pilot and an incorrigible hot dog. On training flights, he liked to dip down low and buzz San Francisco's downtown. Showing off for the civilians seemed to be his greatest joy in life, and it got so bad that General Kenny put out an official order that such antics would not be tolerated. Well, as most pilots are prone to do, he, he disregarded that instruction and he in fact went out with, and did a couple loops around the middle span of the Golden Gate Bridge, went down Market Street waving at the secretaries uh, as he was buzzing through town, and had I gotten so low that evidently he blew down somebody's laundry. And that woman uh, actually filed a complaint with General Kenny. Kenny knew, of course, that Bong's juvenile clouding was not altogether a bad sign. There's a long tradition of cocky fighter pilots indulging their whims. Indeed, Kenny knew that confidence and spirit were traits necessary for fighter pilots to survive in combat. Still, he was a general, and generals have to at least attempt to keep a lid on their pilots. He disciplined Bong regularly, making him wash, dry, and fold the laundry he had blown off the clothesline, for example but he also took note of the young pilot's enormous skills in the air. He actually spotted the spark, uh, I think, when he called him on the carpet in his office. Uh, you know, he was, I don't know what he was expecting when this pilot walked in the door, but here comes this, you know, average size, five foot eight, uh, blonde haired, baby faced uh, Swede, uh, who appeared to be scared to death that he was gonna lose his wings. Bong's passion for flight so impressed Kenny that when General Douglas MacArthur chose Kenny to set up the 5th Air Force Base in the Southwest Pacific, Kenny made sure that Bong was one of the first pilots sent to his new base in Australia. He arrived in September, springtime in the Southern Hemisphere. For more than a month, Bong sat around in Brisbane awaiting delivery of his plane. 
In November, Kenny assigned him to temporary duty with the 35th Fighter Group, based in Port Moresby, New Guinea. New Guinea at the time was a hornet's nest of Japanese aircraft. MacArthur's campaign to reclaim the Philippines had just begun. American forces were beginning the bloody harbor-to-harbor -harbor conquest of New Guinea. The Japanese were throwing everything they could at the arriving American forces. The Army Air Force used a kind of sink-or-swim training method, throwing green pilots into the periphery of battles to ready them for full-fledged air combat. Flying under the careful tutelage of an experienced combat pilot, Captain Tom Lynch, Bong flew long patrols and skirted air battles for nearly a month, learning from Lynch the best tactics for fighting in a P-38. Then, on December 27, 1942, Bong got his first real taste of battle. He was in a flight of 12 P-38s led by Lynch. The flight intercepted 40 Japanese aircraft over Buma on New Guinea's northwest coast. Badly outnumbered, the P-38s charged headlong into the formation. Bong showed no sign of the fear he surely felt. He scored a zero fighter and a VAL bomber. Altogether, the P-38s knocked down a dozen Japanese aircraft. Bong, who had never been in real combat before, earned a silver star for his actions. From that point on, in dependable, almost unspectacular fashion, Bong began to compile what turned out to be the finest combat record in the history of American aviation. It took him only until January to become an ace, scoring his fifth kill over Lay Harbor. In February, Bong left Lynch's shadow and returned to the 9th Fighter Squadron. On March 3rd, on the opening day of the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, Bong flew escort for a flight of B-25 and B-17 bombers attacking a Japanese convoy. Bong knocked down a zero. The bombers sank four Japanese destroyers and eight transports. One and two kills at a time, Bong upped his total. Kenny promoted him to first lieutenant and gave him a two-week leave in Australia. By then, a double ace, Bong enjoyed his R&R but longed to get back into action. The Japanese were throwing thousands of aircraft at the advancing Allies, creating aces almost as fast as the Allies could get pilots into the air. But Bong, perhaps uniquely among American pilots, seemed more interested in the experience and challenge of flight than he was in his kill count. He was an introvert on the ground, uh, shy even, uh, in the air became a different person, became the ultimate fighter pilot. On July 26, Bong had his best day ever. Escorting American bombers attacking Lei, he knocked down four Japanese fighters. General Kenny, who had been so impressed by Bong's skills in training, could barely believe how proficient a warrior the unassuming Swede had become. He put Bong in for a promotion to captain and filed an after-action report that resulted in Bong receiving the Distinguished Service Cross. Bong was, in fact, emerging as a leader. In the almost unspoken competition among pilots to become the ace of aces, he became one to watch. The press started wiring accounts of his combat accomplishments back stateside, and his name started to be mentioned in speculation about whether an American pilot would break Eddie Rickenbacker's seemingly unbreakable record from World War I, 26 combat victories. In November 1943, Bong shot down his 20th and 21st enemy aircraft, a pair of Zeros over the airfield at Rabaul. General Kenny, knowing that his ace pilot was as valuable as a morale-building hero as he was in the air, gave Bong a 60-day leave to return home for a visit. Bong met with General Hap Arnold posed for a few pictures and then returned to Poplar, Wisconsin to enjoy, as ordered by Kenny, a little home cooking. The leading ace of the war was welcomed home as a hero, and while being crowned as honorary homecoming king at his old college, he met Marjorie Vattendahl, the 19-year-old homecoming queen. For the next two months, if he wasn't busy appearing at war bond rallies or launching ships for the war effort, he and Marjorie were together. By the time he left Poplar on the long journey back to the Southwest Pacific, 
he and Marjorie were in love. Captain Richard Bong returned to the Southwest Pacific as the leader in the race to become the ace of aces in hot pursuit of Eddie Rickenbacker's combat kill record. Bong slapped his girlfriend's picture on the nose of his new P-38, which he christened Marge. Five victories behind the record set by Eddie Rickenbacker in World War I, he went into battle with the whole world watching and an advantage over his competition. He was assigned not to the 9th Fighter Squadron, but to 5th Air Force Headquarters. In the competition to become Ace of Aces, the flyer with the most kills, Bong had become the favorite. The press had gathered to watch his achievement. While other pilots' assignments were limited to specific geographical areas where there might or might not be enemy activity, General Kenny allowed Bong to roam where he liked in search of action and Japanese planes to shoot down. But they increased slowly. The number of Japanese aircraft had decreased and the enemy was shifting to a more defensive posture. That limited the number of mass attacks that had created so many American aces. The Southwest Pacific was about as unnatural a habitat for the Wisconsin farm boy as it's possible to imagine. Hot, humid, bug infested and moldy, it was a place that seemed to reek of death. Bong went out almost daily, enduring long, boring patrols. Often he found no enemy aircraft at all. When he did, the combat lasted only minutes, and then a long return flight, often over open water to inhospitable accommodations. That was his reward. On February 15th, the day after Valentine's Day, Bong recorded his first kill in the plane he'd named for the girl back home, Marge. It was his only official kill for the month, though he did destroy a transport as it sat on the runway. The transport, it turned out, was loaded with high-ranking Japanese officers. And while it didn't count on his kill total, it struck a significant blow to the Japanese war effort. On March 8th, the tedium of the war turned to tragedy. Bong had reunited with his former commander from the 35th Bomber Group, Lieutenant Colonel Tom Lynch. The two were flying over a tape Harbor, New Guinea. Bong watched helplessly as his old friend and mentor spun down to his death. For the next month, Bong was ineffective in combat. He flew, but he didn't score any kills until April 3rd, when he knocked down his 25th enemy aircraft. The press gathered in anticipation. The folks back home waited for word of Bong's heroism. On April 12th, Bong shot down three enemy planes in a single day, shattering Rickenbacker's record. The news flashed around the world. Rickenbacker sent a telegram congratulating Bong and promising to send a case of scotch as a reward. General Kenny, doubly pleased that the record had been broken by an officer in his command, sent a case of champagne. Back in the States, Middle America was scandalized that people would send alcoholic beverages to a pilot in a combat zone. To quell the uproar, General Hap Arnold made a big show of shipping Bong two cases of Coca-Cola. Arnold slipped the press copies of his personal note to Bong, stating that America's newest hero would certainly prefer America's favorite soft drink. Bong, still the cheerful baby-faced kid from the North Woods of Wisconsin, was having a ball. What he didn't realize is that by becoming the ace of aces, he had become a national treasure too precious to risk in combat. After he broke Rickenbacker's uh, record at 26 victories, they did everything they could to the point of sometimes setting him down or sending him back on uh, you know, publicity campaigns and things like that back in the States to keep him out of harm's way. He returned to the United States, went on a war bond tour, and most importantly, proposed to Marge Vattendahl. He didn't return to combat for five months, reporting to General Kenny in September 1944 as a gunnery instructor. He could fly, but he was only allowed to fire in self-defense. He defended himself a lot. He shot down five enemy planes in October and three more in November. Kenny suggested to General Douglas MacArthur that Bong ought to get the Congressional Medal of Honor. 
MacArthur agreed and forwarded Kenny's request up the chain of command. In December, Bong went to Taklaban to receive the Congressional Medal from General MacArthur himself. In December, Bong shot down four more planes, bringing his total to 40. General Kenny, who had bent every rule to keep Bong flying, once and for all pulled him out of combat. He shipped his favorite pilot back home, armed with a personal letter to General Hap Arnold and six bottles of Coca-Cola for the flight. Bong arrived back in the United States on New Year's Eve, 1944. He went to Washington, met with Hap Arnold, and participated in what seemed like an endless stream of public appearances, including a press conference with Eddie Rickenbacker. He broke away in February and returned to Wisconsin. There, in the Concordia Lutheran Church, he and Marge married. After his honeymoon, Bong received the plum assignment of flight testing the P-80 Shooting Star, the first American jet. He made 11 flights in the P-80, immersing himself in the theory and engineering of jet engines. On August 6th, he pointed the nose of his jet down the runway for his 12th flight. The plane rolled down the runway perfectly, but as it rose into the air, the engine flamed out. Here's a guy that had, you know, 200 missions, uh, combat missions in the Pacific, shot down 40 enemy airplanes, uh, was shot at on a daily basis, won the Congressional Medal of Honor, comes back to what's supposed to be a relatively safe, safe stateside job and uh, dies in an accident on takeoff in an experimental airplane, the P-80, in California. Dick Bond, the ace of aces, died the day the Enola Gay dropped the atom bomb on Hiroshima. His death, which would have made headlines almost any other day of the war, made barely a ripple in the public consciousness on that particular day. The bomb had dropped. The war Bong had fought in so heroically was about to end. As the whole world prepared to celebrate the end of World War II, Poplar, Wisconsin mourned. In tiny Poplar Cemetery, Dick Bong came home for good. This warbird was a lethal weapon. Its main purpose for being, the reason for its existence, was to attack the enemy in the air, on the ground, or at sea. And that it did with a vengeance. It ranked with the fastest fighters of World War II. It was tough, durable, and versatile. It was called the P-38 Lightning. The P-38 was the fastest fighter in the early stages of the war, and the first fighter useful for long-range escort. It was called upon, at different times, to perform very different roles, and in each case, passed with flying colors. The P-38 was a good airplane. Uh, it was not a major player in the European theater. It was a far better player in the Pacific because it had very good range characteristics. It was excellent for slashing attacks for basically energy management type attacks where it would evade an enemy's more agile and more maneuverable lighter fighters by basically positioning itself with speed and altitude to seize the initiative against an opponent. It had a concentrated armament package. Uh, it had relatively dangerous high-speed dive characteristics because it was one of the first aircraft to approach uh, what we would call sonic conditions. Uh, not the speed of sound, it was not an airplane that could fly very close to the speed of sound, but it would exhibit some of the problems that you had from transonic airflow changes around an aircraft as it begins to fly close to the speed of sound, but it was by no means an inferior airplane, it was a very fine aircraft. The P-38 had a 52-foot wingspan with a total length of just over 37 feet. Its height was 12 feet 10 inches. 
It was powered by two Allison V1700 engines, and it had a maximum speed of 415 miles per hour. It weighed 14,100 pounds empty and 17,500 pounds loaded for battle. With a ceiling of 40,000 feet and a range of 2,260 miles, it could go the distance and deal out a great amount of damage. Where the P-38 really excelled, as I said earlier, was in the Pacific Campaign because they are the combination of twin engines, uh, very long range, uh, really served that aircraft very, very well. The highest, uh, the highest scoring American fighter pilots uh, flew in the Pacific Theater, and uh, the top three uh, all flew the P-38. For that matter, it may have even been more than the top three. There were certainly a number of leading aces in the, in the Pacific Theater who flew the P-38. The Japanese were driving toward Port Moresby, one of the few bases still in Allied control. This was just north of Australia. If this area fell, it threatened to push the Allies into the sea. General Douglas MacArthur quickly reset the stage for an Allied offensive. He relied on General George Kenney, new commander of Allied Air, who was reorganizing the 5th Air Force after the beating it had taken early in the war. MacArthur ordered the troops rushed into battle. One regiment took 36 hours to go by water. A battalion took five weeks by foot. But 60 planes could carry an entire Australian infantry battalion in one day. If the P-38 could protect them, MacArthur thought it just might work. Specially designed airborne equipment such as pint-sized bulldozers and graders helped lay out six airstrips. Around Balbadura, they scraped out runways less than 16 miles from the front. When construction was completed, the P-38 moved in to protect the entire operation. The Southwest Pacific Air Forces, still under the direction of veteran air leader George Kinney and fighter commander Emmett Whitehead, had decided upon a tough, fast, tactical weapon which would stem the tide of Japanese aggression the P-38 Lightning. The P-38 was the one airplane fighter pilots in New Guinea wanted. Kenny and others begged Washington to spare them a few of these high-flying, speedy lightning rods. When they finally got them, the ground crews had a big job on their hands. Fuel tanks, superchargers, armaments, all required major adjustment or repair. Earlier in the war, General Kenny had warned the Pentagon that the Japanese were two days from their factory to the combat zone, and they might swarm all over him. On December 27th, the Japanese did just that. About 11.30 hours, they gave the P-38 pilots the alert. They received the word that the Allied radio station at Domadora had picked up a number of Japanese aircraft approaching the target area. The pilots had waited a long time for this moment, and with the help of their crews, they got going in a hurry. It had taken more than three months to get the P-38s ready for combat. The maintenance crews had worked hard, and now the pilots were about to put the lightnings to the test. As part of the 39th Fighter Squadron, they had flown some patrol and escort missions with the P-38. However, this was to be their first important combat operation. Twelve brand new P-38s were being dispatched to intercept the invading force of unknown strength. Both sides were in for a surprise. At 12.10 hours, they sighted the Japanese. They were out in force. Separating into three flights of four each, the P-38 pilots got on top at 10,000 feet. The Zeros didn't appreciate the view. The P-38 lead flight peeled off to dive in and break up the formation. With his throttle wide open, this P-38 latched on to a Japanese. And then the first lightning struck.
When the air battle was finally over, the 12 P-38 Lightnings had shot down 11 Japanese fighters and bombers. This was a dramatic debut for the P-38 in the Southwest Pacific. The tide was turning, but one battle didn't win a war, and one fighter could not do all the work. But the P-38 had proved its worthiness. The P-38 proved invaluable elsewhere. In North Africa, it was used to fight off the Nazis and protect the local population. These street scenes were photographed by a concealed camera and reveal the true and varied reactions of the public during the raid. A Spitfire takes to the air. This is one of the Allied airfields in the vicinity of Bo. American P-38 rise to the attack. P-38 and Spitfires against Messerschmitts and Junkers. is a Messerschmitt. Most of the bombs fell in the city. Victory everywhere. The crew of this one was captured. Final score, 14 Nazi planes shot down against a loss of four of our own. Another role that the P-38 played was as a photo reconnaissance airship for the Allied forces. The 17th Photo Reconnaissance Squadron stationed on Guadalcanal had an excellent record of supplying the Fighter Command, Bomber Command, and the Naval and Ground Forces with the particular and valuable type of intelligence information that photo reconnaissance could obtain. The plane the air commanders chose for this delicate work was a converted P-38. Here, a radio man tests the communications system and gets a line check from the squadron control station. A maintenance man was responsible for the condition of the camera. Because of the extremely humid climate of the tropics, the cameras had to be removed from the plane after every mission and taken to the camera tent for a complete check. Nearby was the operations board on which all missions were noted. The operations officer would receive a call asking for information concerning a certain area. He would list the data, destination, area to be flown, number of photos desired, etc., and then walk over to the board and then call the pilot and write in his name and mission. After this, the pilot would be briefed. On this area map, the route would be pointed out. These are the Solomons, 
and the course would be an elliptical route from Guadalcanal covering the islands to the northwest and their adjacent waters. Particular information was needed about enemy activity at Buna Island, furthest west in the Solomon Group. The operations officer, with additional information brought in from similar missions, advised the pilot as to which course to take, and was shown the spots where enemy flak and fighters would probably be encountered. The crew was then notified, and the proper camera and films made ready. The modified P-38 could accommodate five cameras. On this mission, two verticals and two obliques were used. For defensive purposes, most of the pilots carried a 45 caliber revolver. Except for a machete, this was all the armament these P-38 pilots carried on a mission. All armor and armaments had been stripped from the plane to accommodate the camera. The pilot's only protection was his speed, which was enough. The P-38 was the fastest photo reconnaissance plane in World War II. General Twining, commanding officer of the 13th Air Force, had stated that the 17th photo reconnaissance paid for itself by relieving heavy bombardment aircraft from reconnaissance missions on which several such heavy aircraft have been lost. In comparison, only one P-38 had gone down in four months of daily reconnaissance flights. The last item before takeoff is the cleaning of all glass through which the cameras shoot. It is interesting to note that only one belly tank was used on this recon. It was preferable not to limit the plane's speed by taking along two tanks, though most pilots felt the P-38 handled less well with one tank. Almost as quickly as the chocks were shoved under the wheels, the film magazine was emptied. No time was lost in getting the film to the field lab and rushing prints to the photo intelligence officer for interpretation. It is possible that one or more of these negatives held information that was of life and death concern to every man in the Guadalcanal area. Photographs can show things that the human eye cannot easily detect. At times, a whole fighter or bomber squadron could fly over an enemy installation and never see it. Furthermore, photos were examined carefully with stereoscopes and by more than one person. They were checked with other photos taken previously to catch minute changes in the arrangement of the terrain and to detect carefully camouflaged installations. Organizing the intelligence which the P-38 pilot had brought in, the intelligence officer gave his superiors a summary of the report. Half an hour had elapsed from the time the P-38 pilot returned from his mission. Already, a fighter squadron was rolling out to the runway, ready to act upon the information obtained by photo reconnaissance. It may be that the photographs and the verbal report disclosed that the enemy was open for attack at Tonalai, Perhaps it was discovered that enemy transports, destroyers, or bombers were sneaking up the channel. 
So out rolled the P-38s. Fighters this time, not recon. Prepared to do a job that the alertness and efficiency of the photo reconnaissance squadron of special P-38s had helped set up. There were many examples of where the stripped-down P-38s doing reconnaissance were able to tell the fully armed lightnings where and when to fight. One of the best examples was a mission where for three days in a row P-38 pilots were sent on a low-level attack to knock out Rabaul on New Britain Island. Here, pilots are shown waiting for the weather to clear at forward staging bases in New Guinea. Then the P-38s got ready. From six squadrons of lightnings, two squadrons had orders to sweep Simpson Harbor. The other four were to attack the land batteries. In all, 80 P-38 lightnings scrambled off. In good flying weather, Allied bombers held their formations as they headed toward Rabaul. Once over the Solomon Sea, the plan went into effect. As the P-38 scanned the skies, they spotted what they were looking for, Japanese Zeros. The lightnings swept in ahead of the bombers to clear the area. The P-38 could outclimb, outdive, and fly faster than the Zero. In all, the P-38s bombed 24 Japanese ships and strafed 17 on this particular mission. These pilots claimed 42 shot out of the sky. The cost? 45 American flyers and 17 American planes. In the space of 12 minutes, a formidable Japanese sea and air armada was attacked and decisively defeated. The P-38 Lightning made it possible. After two years of war, the Japanese strategic plan had been fatally upset. But the Allies knew the war was far from over. The armies of Japan still controlled much conquered territory. General Hap Arnold told the world, there are many roads that lead right to Tokyo, and we're not going to neglect any of them. Relentlessly, the Allied attack continued, spearheaded by the P-38 and the striking power of the U.S. Army Air Force. As the war dragged on, the P-38 continued to play an important role, and not just in the Pacific. For example, in the famous second raid on the Plusty oil fields in March of 1944, the P-38 Lightning was called upon to lead the fighter attack. For hours, the P-38 Lightnings buzzed the Balkans. This was an all-out effort on the part of Allied pilots and crews. When they got within striking distance, the P-38 pilots climbed to bombing altitude and dumped their wing tanks so that they could maneuver better against the sleek Messerschmitts. The P-38 pilots destroyed 29 Nazi planes and damaged three refineries. In spite of its success in operations like the Plusty oil fields, some critics and a few pilots worried over the fact that the P-38 had two engines. Some felt this was a plus in case one engine failed. Others believed it would be hard to fly with only one engine and impossible for the pilot to bail out in case of emergency. You know, there's this whole joke in aviation development that the second engine takes you to the scene of the crash. Uh, one of the problems you have with a twin-engine airplane is that unless you have a very clean airplane, when you lose an engine on a twin-engine airplane, very often you're almost in a controlled crash type situation. The uh, P-38, under most combat circumstances, when you lost an engine, that was a very serious occurrence. The other problem with the P-38 is that there was an engine reliability problem with those boosted 
Allison's. And so sometimes P-38s were lost in combat simply because of engine failure. The Army Air Force felt that a two-engine airplane did not mean that it was a difficult airplane to fly. They believed that the two engines were able to give it a wide range of performance and extra margins of safety. For those who insisted that it was impossible to bail out of the 38 because of the twin booms and rudders and because of the horizontal stabilizer span, the Army and most pilots disagreed. They felt that it was no easier or harder to bail out of the P-38 than out of any single-seater fighter. Bailouts were made either by turning the plane on its back and dropping out, or by getting out the left window and sliding down the wing. Pilots were told not to stand on the wing to jump. As any pilot will acknowledge, the object wasn't to bail out of the plane but to make the other guy bail out of his. The P-38 was a weapon that helped the pilots do just that. It carried plenty of firepower and, unlike the Zero, had self-sealing fuel tanks and armor plating to protect the pilot. In short, the Lightning was tough, rugged, and reliable. Its high-speed performance was well known, but its control at most speeds was equally spectacular from the point of view of performance. If one engine did fail, there was still a workable single engine under the pilot. There was no difference in flight technique with either engine failing. Right engine is dead. Trimming rudder tab. Closing right Prestone shutter and right oil cooler flap. How's about setting the controls for unfeathering? Uh-oh. Feathering switch in normal position. Manual propeller switch in fixed position. Right governor control in low RPM. All set and smooth as silk. Nice going. Now circle for landing. Twenty six hundred RPM with twenty inches. Tap control set at zero. Gear down at one hundred and sixty. Fifty percent flaps. It's in the bag. The P-38 was a weapon that did not have to take a back seat to any plane in the war.
Their one purpose, the sole reason for their existence, is to knock enemy planes out of the sky. They are P-38s, and they rank with the fastest and best fighters in the air today. Now, the fact that this is a two-engine airplane does not mean that it's a difficult airplane to fly. On the other hand, the two engines do give it a wide range of performance and extra margins of safety. Some hangar experts insist that it is impossible to bail out of the 38 because of the twin booms and rudders and because of the horizontal stabilizer span. The truth is that it is no easier or harder to bail out of the 38 than out of any single-seater fighter. Bailouts can be made either, one, by turning the plane on its back and dropping out, or two, by getting out the left window and sliding down the wing. Now, don't stand on the wing to jump. The span of the horizontal stabilizer just doesn't affect the bailout. At high speeds, the airflow carries any object straight back and under the empennage, which is actually higher than the wing. Therefore, the only portion of the empennage which is critical is that portion directly aft of the bailout area. Thus, it doesn't matter whether the empennage has a 20-foot span or a 100-foot span. The critical area is still the same. Furthermore, on the 38, there's no vertical stabilizer which can get in the way. Actually, however, the object isn't to bail out of your ship, but to make the other fellow bail out of his. In the 38, you have a weapon which will help you do just that. It's a fighting man's airplane. Up, rugged, reliable. Its high-speed performance is well known. But its control at low speeds is equally spectacular from the point of view of performance. Presented here with is a new type of airplane, a primary trainer escort, under absolute control at 90 miles an hour indicated. Now, watch its acceleration. Most important of all, maximum performance makes it possible for a 38 pilot to dictate when and at what altitude he shall combat. But to achieve that maximum performance, it is first necessary to understand normal and emergency operation. What we're about to see won't give us any laughs or thrill. But in the thick of battle when the going is tough, might mean the difference between victory or defeat, life or death. Among other things, we'll see what to do for normal routine precautions. For single engine flight, landing, and single engine failure on takeoff. How to handle one or both propellers in operative, or so-called running wild. We will check on use of landing gear and flap emergency extension system. All of these will be seen for the purpose of achieving the true objective of the airplane, maximum performance in combat. And the men best qualified to demonstrate these operations are the men who know the 38 best men who have flown them the most, production pilots. Charlie Brannan. Tom Kennedy. Jimmy Mattern. Avery Black. The pilot who's flown more 38s than any other man is going to take it up from here. He's the chief engineering test pilot, Milo Bircher. We're not going to try to teach you how to fly. You've all had good training in other ships. We're simply going to show you how we handle a 38, hoping to increase your knowledge and skill, and in that way, add to the effectiveness of the ship and to your own safety. There are certain routine precautions which apply to every condition on every flight, so let's take a look at those right off the bat. Before takeoff, the hatch must always be securely latched. Both sliding windows must also be closed all the way. With the windows closed, the airflow is normal. But if the windows are carelessly left open, the airflow is disturbed and causes the wake to hit the tail. On airplanes equipped with external tanks, it is essential to be able to drop the tanks immediately in case of engine failure on takeoff. 
Therefore, before starting, the drop tank switch is placed in the safe position, and the drop tank selectors are placed on. So that in an emergency, we can lose the tanks by simply punching the drop tank release button. When the full fuel load is carried, takeoffs are always on the front tanks. Normally, we use no flaps. Later, we will check on conditions where flaps are used. But at all times, maximum allowable manifold pressure is used. Once in position at the head of the line, and after run-up and mag check, Propellers are checked in the automatic position. By trying the governors, we make certain that they're really governing. Booster pumps are switched on in order to ensure adequate fuel pressure in the event of engine fuel pump failure. Brakes are held while both throttles are advanced to get the maximum allowable manifold pressure. In this case, 40 inches. The object is to get those turbos turning so as to obtain takeoff power at the start of the takeoff run. Furthermore, by holding the brakes as long as possible, we allow the propellers to reach the governing limit of 3,000 RPM at the start of the run. In that way, if they're going to run wild, they'll do it while there's still time to stop the ship. Now, without flaps and using 40 inches of manifold pressure, the 38 starts the takeoff run. Because of the tricycle gear, however, there is no tendency on the part of the airplane to fly itself. Therefore, at about 70 miles an hour, we start to ease back on the stick. At 90 to 100 indicated, after a run of 15 to 1,800 feet, we pull back to break ground. At this point, in spite of the lack of a feeling of lightness, the airplane responds immediately and easily. Gear is up as soon as the ship is committed to flight. By the time the gear retracts, indicated airspeed will be at least 150, well above single engine operation speed of 120. If the boom doors do not close immediately, nosing the plane abruptly down a couple of times usually will close the doors. No flaps are used for normal takeoff because without them, we get the single engine flying speed faster. But if this tower, for instance, were an obstacle 1,700 feet from the head of the runway, a zero flap takeoff would catch it right amidships. With 50% flaps under exactly the same conditions, the airplane easily clears the tower. Airspeed will be at least 140 indicated by the time the gear retracts, which is enough speed to retract the flaps without loss of altitude. Although flaps reduce takeoff run about 500 feet, they only provide a takeoff goose because the rate of climb and speed at zero flaps quickly exceed the initial advantage with flaps. As soon as the airplane is in its climb, power is reduced to 37 inches of manifold pressure and 2600 RPM. At this time, if high altitude flight is not contemplated, booster pumps can be turned off. There's very little difference in the rate of climb at indicated speeds of 140 to 180 because what is gained by the angle increase is lost in speed. The flight characteristics of the 38 are excellent. For example, the stall, which we're about to see, is so slight as to be almost imperceptible to the camera. The power stall will occur at about 70 miles an hour. Loss of altitude will be about 50 feet. The counter-rotating propellers eliminate torque. No tendency of either wing to dip or fall away. Watch closely. There's the stall. Characteristics are just as good in the power-off stall with gear and flaps retracted or extended. Accelerated stalls, accompanied by normal buffeting, occur on any airplane when the angle of attack is increased to the point that the airflow over the wing becomes turbulent. This can happen in sharp turns, pull-outs, or other severe maneuvers. The 38 is designed to take the buffeting of the stall and has no tendency to slip off on either wing at any altitude. If you want to get out of an accelerated stall, permit the airflow to re-establish normal lift by easing up on the stick. 
For the sake of greater maneuverability, there's a maneuvering stop on the flap control. With flaps in this position, turns are shortened, and similar maneuvers performed with great efficiency. Low speed banks at low levels, however, even with the flaps pulled down, are non habit forming. <laughs> There's just not going to be enough time to recover lost altitude before the ground catches up with you. And in practicing maneuvers, there are two things that are darn important. First, where inverted flight is concerned, the engines are not designed for inverted flight of more than 10 seconds. Oil pressure will drop in even less time, and the bearings are apt to be damaged. Furthermore, prolonged inverted flight is in itself unnecessary. Secondly, in any maneuver which requires a downward recovery, the pilot must have plenty of air under him, at least 10,000 feet. Due to the 38th acceleration in a dive, the ground comes up awfully fast to slap you in the face. There's a dive limit chart in the cockpit. Be sure to check it. Landings are not complicated, but in night landings, pilots new to the 38 sometimes get a surprise when lowering the landing light. This is due to the fact that the light disturbs the airflow to the aileron. This nibbling feels a bit strange at first, but actually has no unfavorable effect as far as flying is concerned. For the landing itself, propellers are set for 2,600 RPM with about 23 inches of manifold pressure. And to ensure adequate fuel pressure, on go the booster pumps. Gears extended at 175 miles an hour indicated. Flaps at 150. At this time, the tow brake should be pumped to ensure adequate pressure upon landing. Now let's retract the gear again to show that even if the normal extension system fails, there is still no reason to start getting ideas about a belly landing. Two conditions are usually the cause of hydraulic system failure. Either the engine hydraulic pump has gone out, or there's a break in the hydraulic lines. If the engine pump goes out, fluid will still be in the lines, and the auxiliary hand pump can be used to extend both the gear and flaps. No other action except pumping is required, and it will take about five minutes to pump the gear down and lock. If... After two or three minutes of pumping, there is no feeling of pressure against the pump. It indicates that there is fluid failure. In this case, the emergency system is still on tap. The emergency extension system is used in the following sequence. First, landing gear control lever is placed down. Next, the bypass valve is closed by turning it clockwise. Now the hand pump selector valve handle is placed down and the pump is operated to force the doors open with the wheels. Pumping is continued until all three wheels are fully extended and locked. Nosing the ship abruptly up will help force the wheels out. While pumping, the selector valve handle should be checked down to make sure it hasn't moved out of position. Flaps can also be extended by the hand pump. To do this, the flap control handle is placed down. Then the selector valve handle is set to up, and the pump operated till the flaps are extended the desired amount. If for any reason the flaps will not extend, the airplane lands well enough without them. In a zero flap landing, however, allow for float and higher stalling speed. With booster pumps on, the gear down and flaps in 50% position, the approach is made at 120 miles an hour indicated. Speed is reduced to 110. And when the approach is in the bag, the flaps are extended full down. Then, at 110, flare out and come in over the fence at 100 to 105 miles an hour, but never faster than 110. Contact never has to be made at over 100 miles an hour. The 38 lands in the same attitude as ships with conventional gear on the two main wheels. The nose wheel will settle of its own accord. Don't be tricycle gear conscious. Just be flying level somewhere near the ground. Flying, not falling. And then the less the pilot does, the better. For slowing down, brakes are applied on and off, rather than with a constant pressure. There is only one way possible to make landing the 38 difficult. Try to bring it in on its nose wheel. 
Nose wheel landings are expensive ways of messing up the landscape. And sometime or other, everybody feels a little sorry for pilots just starting to fly single-seat fighters. Second-hand information doesn't apply anymore to pilots graduating to the 38, because an instruction version is now available as a two-place airplane. The boys call it the piggyback. Now a new pilot can ride in back of the instructor and have any procedure cleared up for him in flight. This is how it works. A couple of weeks ago, a new 38 Army pilot visited the field. Wrap your legs up, Bill, and make yourself at home. Come on, Jay. This being a passenger is a good deal. I feel like a colonel already. Hmm, the last guy thought he was a general. <laughs> well, all kidding aside, Milo, I hope you don't think me a dope if I ask a lot of fool questions. You know a better way of finding something out? Well, no, but... Well, then ask away. Okay. Well, I did have a couple of question marks about the propellers running wild. Not that I don't understand perfectly, but... Well, you know, it just isn't quite clear. Well, there's nothing serious about propellers running wild. No? It usually simply means that they're caught in full high RPM. And as a result, the engines are overspeeding. This can happen due to a shortened electrical system, or the switch is being left in manual instead of automatic. Or maybe the circuit breaker switches are out at the start. Right. But no matter what causes propeller over-revving, retarding the throttles will bring them under control and still leave enough power to at least circle the field and land. Propellers will run wild if, through carelessness, the propeller switches are left in manual instead of being checked in automatic. In this case, RPMs will be reduced by simply throwing the switches where they belong, in automatic. On late versions of the 38, warning lights go on when there's a short in the circuit. If a short occurs, the circuit breakers overheat and jump up. When they do, push the circuit breakers down. They'll have to be held down for about 15 seconds. Otherwise, the heat will just make them jump right back. I got gotcha. you. If we don't let them cool off, they'll pop right back up again. Can we simulate this in flight? When we get in the air, you'll see that holding the circuit breakers down for 15 seconds has disadvantages. But now we're ready for the takeoff check. Propellers and automatic. Governing check. Booster pumps on. Tow brakes held. Throttles advanced to get maximum allowable manifold pressure. warn us that there's a short. And the propellers jump from 3,000 to 3,500 RPM. Shoving down the circuit breakers will help control the propellers. But the 15 seconds that they have to be held down is a long time in flying to have one hand committed to a single action. 
Therefore, it's better to retard the throttles and bring the RPMs down to 3,000 while still maintaining sufficient power to establish level flight before pushing the circuit breakers down. Now, with flight established, the circuit breakers can be held down. And if they stay down, as much power as is desired can be put on, and the propellers will be governing properly. If one engine were damaged by over-revving, the propeller would be feathered right away, and single-engine flight would be necessary. But correct single-engine flight procedure must be followed. There are only three main steps. The first step will be to set the dead engine mixture control to idle cutoff so as to reduce fire hazard by stopping the flow of fuel at once. Furthermore, if by mistake we try to kill the engine that's operating, the complete loss of power warns us while there's still time to recover. So if the right engine were to quit, the three main steps would be, first, right mixture control to idle cutoff, second, right feathering switch to full feather, and third, right throttle back to close. That's all there is to getting set for single engine flight. If the flight is going to be for any duration, though, there are five more simple operations which are mainly precautionary and intended to reduce drag. Turn the right booster pump off. Trim the rudder tab. Close the right tank selector valve. Close the right press tone shutter. And close the right oil cooler flap. Now, that's one of the handy features of the 38. If one engine fails, there's still a mighty fine single engine ship under us. There's no difference in flight technique with either engine. But for demonstration, we like to fly on the left engine and keep the generator going, rather than use the right engine and run on the battery. What we've just checked over have been the emergency procedures for a single engine failure. But for practicing single engine operation and maneuvers, slightly different procedures are followed so that if necessary, the simulated dead engine can be brought back into operation quickly. In the first place, be awfully sure that the live engine is on the tank with the most fuel. Then, and only then, start the procedure for single engine practice flight. Now, turn the right booster pump off. Then by retarding the right throttle, single engine failure and the resultant yaw will be simulated. Recover from yaw with opposite rudder and throw the right mixture control to idle cutoff and feather up. After the engine has stopped, trim the rudder tab and fair the right press stone shutter and right oil cooler flap. After the engine has stopped and the ship is trimmed, the control should be set in position for immediate unfeathering just in case something should happen to the engine we're flying on and we have to use the engine being simulated as dead. So, as soon as the propeller is feathered, set the feathering switch in the normal position. Then, raise the guard on the manual propeller switch to the dead engine and set it to the fixed position and move the governor control to low RPM. Now, with the feathering switch in normal position, the manual propeller switch to the dead engine in fixed pitch position and the right governor control in low RPM we can continue single engine practice flight safely. Unfeathering to resume normal two engine flight takes only four steps. Manual propeller switch is held to increase RPM until 800 is reached, and then throw the switch to the automatic position. Right mixture control is set to water rich. Check to make sure that there is sufficient oil and fuel pressure. Open the throttle slowly, and as the press tone temperature rises, Continue advancing it slowly. At 25 inches of manifold pressure, RPMs are also increased until power and propellers on both engines are synchronized. In unfeathering, we have to advance the throttle slowly because the dead engine is cooled off and sudden application of power would be apt to result in serious backfiring. But no matter if the single engine flight is due to necessity or for the sake of practice, the procedures for flight and landing will be the same. For single engine cruising, satisfactory power is 
31 inches of mercury and 2,300 RPM. For single-engine climb, 37 inches of mercury and 2,600 RPM are satisfactory. Use of more power is unnecessary and depends on the weight conditions of the plane. At an altitude of 20,000 feet, the 38 on one 1150 horsepower engine can hit 205 miles an hour indicated airspeed. Figuring pressure and outside air temperature, the true speed is actually about 282 miles an hour. Loss of range in flying on one engine is about 20%. In cases of prolonged single engine flight, fuel will have to be drawn from the tanks of the dead engine. Now, Bill, you reach over to do this. First, turn the selector to the tank which is to supply fuel. Then set the cross-feed valve switch to cross-feed position and turn the other selector off. The single-engine maneuvers we're about to go through are to show the flexibility of the ship and are recommended only for combat emergency. A single-engine aileron roll is simple enough. But the engine design, as we know, doesn't allow inverted flight of more than 10 seconds due to the loss of oil pressure. The single-engine stall characteristics are at least the equal of most single-engine planes. The power stall occurs at 90 miles indicated, and the recovery is the same as with two engines. Now, here's the stall. There's a big change in directional trim with change in speed comparable to the torque effect in single-engine airplanes. This is more pronounced in the slow-speed range. At high speed, the trim approaches the normal for twin-engine operation. And now, while we're heading back for a landing, there's one important thing to keep in mind. Never count on a two-engine plane maintaining altitude on one engine with both the gear and flaps pulled out. The landing approach is made at 2,600 RPM with 20 inches of manifold pressure. At about 160, gear is let down. Dab control will be set at zero because there's very little torque with low power. At 135 miles an hour, flaps are extended 50%. Power and speed are decreased in the approach pattern, but 120 is maintained throughout the approach. Once full flaps are extended, the landing must be made. There is no choice in the matter. So only extend flaps 100% when you see it's in the bag. Retard the throttle and come in over the fence at 110. Then flare out, making contact at between 95 and 100 miles an hour. Boy, if I'd known how easy that baby flies on one engine, I'd never bother. Well, it's not easy and it's not hard. It's just to know how it's like it. Here, Bill, this will give you some idea of what I mean. Too flat an approach on single engine is definitely bad. It's apt to result in undershooting the field. The high approach can be made by diving down and leveling off short of the field. But the recommended approach has been found to be the easiest as well as the safest. It's okay to use some power to actually contact the ground. Uh-huh. Hey, one engine's quit. He's still got another engine. He made it, but boy. Come here, I want to show you something. I think that's Tony LeVere. Uh, Tony, simulate single engine failure on takeoff. Okay, Milo, I'll cut the right engine. The right engine will quit at 120. 
Power is reduced and hard left rudder to check yaw. Power increased. Drop tank release button punch to drop the tank. Right mix to control off. Full feather right propeller. Right throttle off. The other procedures are carried out while level flight is maintained until 140 miles an hour. And now he climbs to a safe altitude. Remember, Bill, this is your first crack at it, so take it easy. Okay. Side windows closed, hats secure. Straighten nose wheel. Nose wheel straight. Drop tank switch at safe. Selectors on. Engine practice flight on left engine. Make sure that you'll be on the tank with the most fuel. Switching from front to rear main. Right booster pump off and set to cut throttle. Go to it. Right throttle off, hard left rudder to check yaw. Mixture control to idle cutoff. Right propeller feathered up. Right engine is dead. Trimming rudder tab. Closing right Prestone shutter and right oil cooler flap. How's about setting the controls for unfeathering? Uh-oh. Feathering switch in normal position. Manual propeller switch in fixed position. Right governor control in low RPM. All set and smooth as silk. Nice going. Now circle for landing. Twenty six hundred RPM with twenty inches. Tap control set at zero. Gear down at one hundred and sixty. Fifty percent flat. It's in the bag. The thirty eight is a weapon does not have to take a back seat to any plane in the world. It's a man's airplane, effective and versatile. But remember that it is an airplane, and don't lose respect for it. Learn to take advantage of its strong features, both of safety and attack. The skies belong to you.